Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. <laughs> Fear and chaos at Market Square. Tonight, for the very first time, we're seeing what police and other people saw and heard the moment shots were fired at Fiesta de los Reyes. The shooting a little more than one month ago, San Antonio police officers opened fire as they say two suspects shot at each other in the middle of that crowd of people. And tonight we see how all the chaos unfolded on April 28th. A few hours ago, SAPD released the video, which we're about to show you. It comes from the body cameras of two separate officers who SAPD says didn't fire their weapons that night. Let's take a look. So you see a crowd gathered right there on Concho Alley and De La Rosa when suddenly you're about to see it. People duck and that's when SAPD says the first shots were fired. Now this part of the video right here, it doesn't have sound. Then you can see police running through the crowd and towards the suspects. The shots get louder. You're about to hear that along with someone saying get down several times. <laughs> OK, so here's another look from another officer's body cam video who again didn't fire their weapon. Police are saying that officers responded after 18 year old Mikey Valdez and 20 year old Albert Cisneros were seen shooting at each other that night right in the crowds. Now, in the interest of transparency, we chose to freeze this video so you won't hear the final shots or see the two suspects who were killed on the ground. Those two suspects died. Five other people were hurt in that gunfire. And tonight, there are still a lot of questions about what happened. We still don't know if those bystanders were hit by police gunfire or from the suspects own weapons. Yeah, the police department says it's investigating all of that. Stay with us as we stay on top of the story. In other news, now the U.S. Census Bureau is backing up what many of you have been saying. Yes, San Antonio is the fastest growing city in the United States. The question is whether the housing market can handle all that heat. The night team's Avery Everett sat down with two realtors who say the city needs to focus on affordable housing. We need apartments. We need more housing. It sounds simple, but with an explosion in San Antonio's population, having enough housing might not be so easy. We need more housing accessibility and we don't have it. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau shows 22,000 people moved here in 2023. That puts San Antonio back in the number one spot for the country's fastest growing city. But there are concerns that growth could eventually strain the real estate market. I am very, very worried about our housing in San Antonio. So where do we stand right now? Realtors say it's a seller's market, meaning more people are trying to buy homes than sell them. The market is leading towards positivity rather than negativity. Good options are still out there for buyers. Some brokers say you just have to expand your search. They may not find it in the exact neighborhood that they want or the preferences that they want. That's a completely different question. But these realtors say affordable housing for low income families may be harder to find. Now we need to make sure that there's enough housing for our most vulnerable populations. How can the city do that? Nonprofits like My City is My Home are asking San Antonio leaders to take several steps, like increasing vouchers and promoting the online housing portal. They have the answers. They need to act on them. That housing portal is one of the city's biggest preventative efforts right now when it comes to housing concerns and homelessness. There's a questionnaire you can fill out completely anonymously if you want that allows you to explain your situation. The portal then will shoot out a list of resources you can use and how to access them. We have that link on KSAT.com. Could be a valuable tool. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Now, while I was watching your story, I was just thinking, now imagine how much harder it is to get out of poverty. Right. If you're looking at housing that's uh, this expensive. Now, you've done several stories covering that before. Steve has done multiple. I mean, so many people across our team because this is such an interconnected issue across right. our city, right? Even when we were doing our Know My Neighborhood right. um, episode in downtown, talking about all the resources that are available, affordable housing always comes back to this conversation of homelessness. Yeah, and when you talk about homelessness, 
there's a point in time count. And I right. know that the data was just released. I believe it's an organization called Close to Home yes. released data today. What does it show about San Antonio? So it does show an increase, right? Um, they did this count back in January and they basically uh, on one night of the year, they go out and count as many people as they can across shelters and on streets and in all different scenarios. And we saw that that count this year was just under 3,400 people. So that breaks down, you can break that data down into so many different ways, but sure. specifically unsheltered and sheltered mm -hmm. people. Unsheltered went up about 1% and sheltered people went up about 9%. So we're seeing an increase across the board and that's why these resources are so necessary. Avery Everett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Is it an accidental death or murder? A woman dead tonight after her husband claimed he accidentally shot her in the head? But the Bear County Sheriff's Office not sure they're buying that explanation. They're investigating this case as a murder. Happened about 1030 this morning on a street called Gunsight Pass, not far from 211 and Calabar Road. BCSO says the man called deputies himself to let them know what happened. He was detained for questioning. According to Sheriff Salazar, this is not the first time deputies have received a call from this house back in December. They responded to that same home for a domestic violence situation. That leads us to this. We want to remind you, if you or a loved one is in a domestic violence situation, you can get help. There are ways to get out. Scan the QR code on your screen for a list of some of those resources. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Garcia, guilty of the offense of intentionally or knowingly causing serious bodily injury to a child as charged in the indictment. So you heard it right there, guilty, a jury convicting Daniel Garcia in the death of five-year-old Dominic Aguilar Acevedo. That jury heard five days of testimony before they reached a verdict this morning. Garcia was found guilty of beating that little boy to death in San Antonio. And then he and the child's own mother, Nicole Aguilar, dumped Dominic's remains in Colorado and then fled the country. Garcia showed no emotion as that verdict was being read. Now a judge is going to decide his punishment. That's going to be in August and he should face anywhere from five to 99 years or even life in prison. For the first time in our history, a jury in New York now deliberating a criminal case against a former U.S. president. About three hours into deliberations, the jury in former President Donald Trump's hush money trial sent the judge a note requesting sections of that testimony to be read back to them. That read back set for tomorrow morning when the court convenes. The former president facing 34 first degree felony counts of falsifying business records. So we're talking about election night. It's in the books and so is that one race that got a ton of attention from the very start. You know this, that race got downright nasty. Republican incumbent Tony Gonzalez declaring victory in the runoff for U.S. District 23. He won by just 407 votes. So when they say that every vote counts, that's what they mean. Now, Gonzalez beat out popular YouTube personality and gun activist Brandon Herrera. Herrera could request a recount, but no word tonight on whether he will. So for now, Gonzalez is going to go on to face Democrat Santos Limon in the general election come November. Now, there were other races in last night's election, runoff races, that is. You could scan the QR code on your screen to see those full results on our Vote 2024 page on KSAT.com. It was a stinky situation. Neighbors called us for help with a sewage leak. Tonight, the city says the problem at the Brynwood Apartments has been fixed. It's an update to a story we've been following for several weeks now. This is what we found on May 13th when we first visited that complex on the city's northwest side. Feces, toilet paper, and frustrated neighbors who say this leak had been a problem for two to three months. Code enforcement told KSAT any sewage leak is a health code violation. They were given 10 days to fix the issue. The complex owners were. We checked with code enforcement yesterday. Its crews visited found the complex to be in compliance. Good news. We've called the Brynwood Apartments and its property management company several times, including yesterday and again today. Our John Paul Barajas left voicemails. We have still not heard back. So what can you do if you have an issue with your apartment complex? Well, Development Services says the best way is to call 311. That helps them keep track of recurring issues. The city can also place an apartment complex in its proactive apartment inspections program if necessary. Look what she made them do. San Antonio couple flying to Germany just to see Taylor Swift this summer. Mia Garza White and her husband are basically gig tripping. They're planning a two week long trip, which includes a night at the Eras tour in Germany. Now she tried getting tickets right here in the US. 
unaffordable. Gapsa White says the flight and concert ticket abroad combined were actually cheaper. My husband and I realized that we could go to Germany, see her for lower cost, and actually coincide it with an abroad trip we wanted to take anyway. And both of them combined, it was just a more convenient, better price for everything. Ooh, think about that. Now, that trip comes on the heels of a major lawsuit involving Ticketmaster and its parent company, Live Nation. Texas joining the feds in suing them, accusing the company of monopolizing the concert industry. In a statement, Live Nation says that increasing production costs, artist popularity, and ticket scalping are what's responsible for those higher ticket prices. Chances are you either use Social Security now or you will. Millions of Texans are in the former category and they depend on the program for food, for shelter, but they could lose part of that aid unless you get involved and do something to protect Social Security. So stick around for that. For years, it's been a popular spot to grab a drink, maybe watch a concert on the northwest side, but now they're calling it quits, at least for now. An update next on The Night Beat. Americana country music star Pat Green was once one of the co-owners. The Rustic, a popular Northwest Side bar and concert hall at the Rim, has closed its doors. This note posted outside the building states that the restaurant is looking towards a bright future with a vision to relocate. Now, in that letter, the restaurant's owners cite ongoing road construction near the area as a reason for closing. It's a pretty good reason. The owners also say they're exploring other areas with the goal of relocating to a quote, more accessible and vibrant location, end quote. You can read the full letter right now on KSAT.com. Next week, KSAT and the AARP are gonna hold an event to discuss the future of Social Security. And we just have to remind you, this isn't just a program for older Americans. Yeah, more than a million widows, children, and disabled people in Texas depend on Social Security to survive. Here's the thing though, the future of that program is at stake and people across San Antonio are worried about what that means for their future. Once I retire, I'll have three sources, three main sources, and, and that one of them is to be Social Security. I do have, you know, my grandma that's still alive, you know, today and it's just, you know, making sure they're in the best position possible. And so she gets Social Security. She does. 100% disabled from the, from the accident. So no, I wouldn't make it without Social Security. All three people you just met live with different challenges and all depend on Social Security, whether it's for themselves or for their loved ones. The program gives them peace of mind, something to count on when there are so many unknowns. I am relying on that as part of our um, financial future. In Texas alone, the AARP estimates more than four and a half million people receive Social Security benefits. Most are retirees, each receiving an average of just under $1,800 a month. Disabled workers in Texas get less, averaging about $1,500. According to Zillow, San Antonio's median monthly rent is just over $1,700. So although Social Security benefits aren't hefty, they do help people pay for some housing and food. But what if the benefits are reduced? That's going to put me in a spot. Trustees with Social Security say without congressional action, benefits will get cut by 17% by 2035. That scares Deborah Jones, who will fully rely on Social Security once she retires. Food keeps going up. Everything keeps going up. So, I mean, even now when I cook, I, I, I'm very frugal. Yeah, what she said just hit. So many people have the same story, but this is where you come in. Next Wednesday, June 5th, KSAT and the AARP are going to host a forum to discuss the future of Social Security. And you know what? We'd like you to be there. It's happening from 11 to 1 at Stable Hall, which is at the Pearl. And you see that QR code all the way to your right? We want you to scan it because that's going to take you to a website where you can register and get free tickets to attend. Now, I'm going to be moderating that discussion along with three other people who understand what's really at stake for Texans. And we're going to discuss how you can keep Social Security strong. We hope to see you there. An important discussion. All right, let's talk about the weather right now. And the fact we've seen storms or at least the threat of storms the last couple of nights. Kind of calm outside tonight. Very calm tonight, but we will take a look back at last night, how much rain fell and how much especially fell over the drought stricken parts of our area and the most extreme drought 
stricken parts of our area. First, let's get to our headlines. I want to point this out. We do have more storm chances, but they're transitioning from the typical afternoon and early evening time frame to late night and early morning time frame. High temperatures, mid 90s. We're not talking triple digits anymore. The triple digits are taking a little bit of a welcomed hiatus for now, and the heat indices won't be outrageous. Smoke, if you notice today, the sky actually looked blue for a change. We don't have as much smoke in the air right now from the annual agricultural fires. Still a, a little bit from those fires in Mexico, but not a whole lot, not as noticeable. And we'll still have a little bit in the air the rest of this week. Earlier today, thunderstorm activity closer to the Gulf Coast. Even a few crept their way into parts of Lavaca County just outside of Hallettsville, and most of it, though, is closer to Houston. What our storm chances hinge on over the next couple of nights and early mornings is development in West Texas and North Texas. You see tonight we already have a few pop up storms in West Texas. We're not expecting that action to make it here, but with the steering flow in our atmosphere, any storm complexes that come together and organize to in West Texas or North Texas can get pushed our way and then we get the leftovers from them. We see this kind of pattern fairly frequently this time of year and notice our future cast kicking up around a storms cluster of storms north texas and even west texas tomorrow and then it turns into a wait and see okay how much do they organize where exactly will where will they be pushed and the steering flow aloft where the leftovers going to be taken because we may not get the brunt of these storms as we usually don't however the storm leftovers, that's the key. Whatever's left of them can move in. Like last night, we had a few isolated severe storms, but most of it was just some pretty good rain. So we're watching for the leftovers, and that's typically a nocturnal situation. So instead of the usual peak of daylight heating, this is the kind of action we usually get late at night or early in the morning. All right, here's the latest drought monitor, and you, you can obviously see this area of red here in the hill country the extreme drought and even the severe drought. I'm going to highlight just those areas and outline them and now put the rainfall estimates from Doppler radar on top of it and especially hone in on this bolder outlined area. This is where we have that extreme drought. But look at this. You see the yellows and oranges that indicates over two inches of rain, two to three inches of rain estimated by Doppler radar in those areas. And that's where we have the extreme drought. Look at this near comfort, about a quarter of an inch, but you get up just north of comfort, 3.5 inches, Kerrville two and a half, just west of Bandera over three inches. And look at this for verification, almost two and a half inches downtown Kerrville. Good to see last night. The potential going forward the next seven days, mostly North Texas and again, and even West Texas, that's the action that we can sometimes tap into in the kind of weather pattern we're going to be in through this weekend. 75 in the morning, 94 in the afternoon, yeah, more of the same temperature wise. We'll be in the mid 90s for highs and then storm chances right now at 30% the next several nights through the middle of the weekend. Uh, at least there's chances. Hey, there is chances. And like I said, it's a unique situation that, you know, we do see around here where we really just have to watch what develops to the north and west. And then we hope for the leftovers and remnants. Not as hazy. That's what we like to see out of the live cam right now. Not as much smoke. Absolutely. Getting a little better. We like it. I wonder if the Brahma Mamas are going all the way up. <laughs> That's a great question. And I would love it if they travel, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what a great support group that is for the San Antonio Brahmas who are going to play at St. Louis. And the Brahmas need to win this game because home field is on the line. And our Lady of the Lake Saints softball team, they are on top of the world. Coming up. I'm so <laughs> I'm so honored to to finish my career as a national champion and and for these seniors. If you would have told me five years ago that we'd be bringing a red banner back to the west side of San Antonio, I mean I I would have asked you what just what you're drinking because I want some of that. I mean so it's it's amazing. Yeah, the Olu Saints are on top of the NAIA softball world as national champions in big board sports.
to the United Football League. San Antonio Brahmas are preparing for their final game of the regular season when they take on the St. Louis Battlehawks this weekend. The Brahmas have won three in a row and proven to seven and two while holding down first place in the XFL Conference with St. Louis right behind them. The Brahmas are coming off an 18 to nine win against their previously undefeated Birmingham Stallions, holding them to single digits for the first time this season and 27 points below their season average. We take a lot of pride in, in what we do and, and how we do it. So. I think that's that's a big a big factor. We got a lot of leaders in our on our defense and in our room that take pride in this and take pride in, in what we do every day every day, watching film and stuff like that. So I think that I think that helps us a lot. The Brahmas will need to be solid on both sides of the ball when they face the Battle Hawks because the winner will get home field advantage the following week when the same two face off in the playoffs for the XFL Conference Championship. Yeah, it's pretty important. You know, we want to be back in San Antonio in the dome, so you know, a win this week would put us back there for, you know, home field advantage in front of a great fan base. Yeah, having home field, uh, I just like this Birmingham game. I think, you know, we played a really good team. Uh, if we can get that crowd again, you know, it gives us a great advantage. The Battle Hawks will host the Brahmas this Saturday, June the 1st at 3 p.m. at the Dome at the America Center. The Hawks beat the Brahmas at the Alamo Dome 31-24 back in mid-April. Our Lady of the Lake softball is coming home with the red banner after winning the NAIA Softball World Series for the first time in program history today. Top of the first inning against the Jessup Warriors. This ball is hitting the foul territory and Saints shortstop Alyssa Garcia races a long way to make the catch. That's awesome. Bottom three, the Saints get on the board first. Marissa Bradley hits one down the left field line. And fair, that score is Kayla Dries, who led off the inning with a single. And it's one to nothing, Saints. Bottom of the six, the Saints get an insurance run when Madison Garza goes a big fly to left field and gone solo shot. And that's more than enough with Cassie in the circle. Our Lady of the Lake wins two to nothing. And they're coming back as national champs with their first red banner. Here's your tournament MVP. It's a lot. I mean, I'm feeling a lot of emotions right now um, just because we were here last year and, and, you know, we worked so hard for it. And everything, every practice, everything we've put into this season, it it shows. And, and it's so unreal, honestly. <laughs> it's such a surreal moment. And I'm so I'm so happy for, for these girls and for these seniors that we get to to finish our, our careers as national champions. So it's awesome. Awesome. I'm so proud of us. And here's a trophy that's coming back home with the Saints. Olu finishes the season 57 and three overall as national champions. And they're bringing back the first red banner in school history across their 18 sponsored sports. It was Victor Knight at the Wolf for the missions played a doubleheader after the break. Texas Rangers shortstop Corey Seager continued to swing a hot bat. Bottom of the fifth at home today, he smacks a two-run job the right field to make it four nothing Rangers. He homered for the eighth time in eight games, and the Rangers win six to one, sweeping the two-game series with the Diamondbacks. It was Victor Wembanyama night for the San Antonio Missions doubleheader at the Wolf. Fans were rocking Wimby jerseys. There was a raffle for Spurs memorabilia, including a couple of graded Wimby cards and a poster with a piece of basketball and a couple of jerseys. Plus, this little French bulldog. Brave the heat. Here he, she, or he comes for some baseball. How cute, right? As for the game, the Frisco Rough Riders got out to a great start, scoring three runs in the first. And in the second, Cody Freeman chops in over the third baseman, bringing in two more to add to the Rough Riders' lead. The missions tried to mount a comeback. Here's a sacrifice fly into deep right center field. That'll bring home Brandon Valenzuela to get the missions on the board. Now let's check out the final score from game one. The Rough Riders take it six to three. Game two, at last check, the Rough Riders, who are the home team in this game, even though it's at the Wolf. We're leading the mission 6-4 to four after six innings. Big congratulations to Our Lady of the Lake yes, University. How cool is that? First ever NAIA championship. Yeah, my favorite story of the day for sports. Yeah, can't I wait love, to see them I mean, back on campus. They've worked really hard, and I love that you've been following them throughout. Yeah. That's good. Awesome. We'll be right back. Everyone knows too much sun can be bad for your skin, but it could also be bad for your phone. Battery damage and performance issues are just a few examples of what could happen when your phone gets too hot. Yeah, you don't want that to happen because then you can't access your phone. You could read more about it on KSAT.com. Had it happen to me. Adam, I'm guessing in the South Texas sun, you've had it happen to you a time or two where your phone just stops working. Plenty of times it overheats, sometimes it even tells you it's too hot. By the way, here's some good news. Look at these rain gauges. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> Southern Bear County, three quarters of an inch. Old school technology.